Hi, I'm Mike and I'm new to watchmaking. In this video, I'm going to attempt my first complete service on a mechanical watch, which is not running. I hope by sharing my watch repair stories, you'll be inspired on your own watchmaking journey, or at the very least, be entertained. Let's get started. This is Carlton, a Swiss-made three-hand men's wristwatch that was probably manufactured in the late 1940s or early 50s. Carlton doesn't have much of a pedigree and has kindly volunteered as today's victim, I mean model. Like a good cadaver, I mean teaching tool, Carlton's insides are typical of the majority of mechanical watches and will serve as a great example of what you will find when you dig into your first mechanical watch project. The insides confirm that there are 17 jewels and an Inca block setting on the balance wheel, which is a shock absorbing jewel mount. With some puffs of air from my dust blower, I'm trying to get the balance wheel spinning. There's threaded holes for case clamps in the movement, but this watch just uses a metal spacer to keep the movement centered in the case. Let's go take a look at this on the microscope and we'll see what else we can learn about this watch. I don't recognize anything as being broken, but the watch is definitely dirty and the chrome plating is coming off the case and some of the gears. Here's a closer look at the Inca block shock mount for the balance wheel jewel. The jewels in most watches are man-made rubies that are low friction pivot points for the axles on the gears and wheels. Once again, I'm blowing on the balance wheel to watch what happens. The hairspring at the center of the balance wheel looks like it's intact and the coils are concentric with each other. This little sprocket is called the click and it keeps the mainspring from unwinding. But we want to let the power out of the mainspring to service the watch. So we're going to carefully disengage the click while we hold on to the winding stem and let the spring power down in a controlled way. To get the movement out of the case, we need to remove the crown and the stem, which is held in place by this small screw. The screw just needs to be loosened and the stem should slip out of the keyless works, which is the part of the watch that winds the spring and sets the hands. Carlton doesn't want to give up his crown, so we're going to have to take it by force. With the stem removed, we can lift the case off of the watch movement and have a closer look at the dial. The dial is dusty but otherwise in pretty good shape, so I'm going to loosen some of the dust and then blow it off with my blower. The raised markers on the dial show some pitting, but the painted surface looks pretty good. Taking a look at the hands, ah, the paint and finish is serviceable, but you can see that there's deterioration of the loom. More on that later. And if we take a closer look at the second hand, there's some alpaca hair around the second hand. Part of evaluating any watch project is trying to determine what's rust and corrosion and what's just dirt. Ooh, it's gross, but I'm really glad that it's just dirt and it seems to be coming off pretty well. Let's clear up what we can as we go. Our first step to dismantling the watch will be taking off the hands. I'll use a plastic bag to keep these pry tools from scratching the dial of the watch. Now I have to say I didn't make the best approach here. The pry tool on the right just wasn't engaging, but it was good enough and we got the hands off as much as we needed to. Just a gentle lifting motion and they both come off as a stack. And now we can carefully use our tweezers to remove the hands. With the hands off, we can take off the dial, which is held on by two small screws. Look at that teeny, tiny little screw right there. It should just take a few turns of the screw to loosen the post so you can pull the dial clear. Some watches also use clips to hold on the dial. When you remove the dial, be careful you don't lose the dial washer, which is sitting on top of the hour wheel. 
You should then be able to easily slip the hour wheel off of the cannon pinion. When I remove a part, you'll often see me flip it over just to inspect it. We're done with the dial side of the watch for now, so let's turn our attention to the back of the movement, also called the bridge side. This movement holder securely raises the movement off your work surface so you don't damage the side of the watch that's pointing down, and you can more easily access the parts facing up and move it around as needed. The first thing I'll remove is the balance wheel assembly. By getting the balance wheel out of the way, there's less of a chance that we will damage the delicate hairspring during the disassembly. Here's a tip. Take a good look at each screw you remove and use photos or notes to remember where they go. Screws can look similar, but not be identical. Bridges and cover plates often have openings designed to give you a safe place to pry and hold the part from, so you'll often see me pick up the movement holder to get a better look and adjust my angle of approach. When I pick up the balance assembly, I'm carefully sandwiching the hairspring between the balance wheel and the balance bridge, sometimes called the balance cock. You'll often see me place a part down with the tweezers and then pick it up with a different grip, especially if I need to flip the part over and my hand position isn't right. We'll put this aside for later. With the balance gone, we can see the manufacturer and reference number of the movement. This movement says AS, which is the maker, A. Schild. The number, 1187-94, also called the caliber, is the key to finding parts and support documentation for a watch. If you were searching for this movement, then you would type it like this, AS Cal 1187-94. But it can also be spelled out like this, A. Period Schild, Cal 1187-1194. Understanding the different variations is important because different searches will give you different results. I searched two different ways in eBay and got very different results, but both results were relevant. Back on the microscope, with the balance out of the way and a slight wind in the spring, we can see if the pallet fork is moving back and forth properly and allowing the escape wheel to advance. In a healthy watch, the pallet lever will snap back and forth decisively between the banking pins. The back and forth motion of the pallet is what gives a wristwatch its tick-tock sound. The gears that turn the hands, or train of wheels, is held in place by the train bridge. Whoa, did you see that? That's what happens when there's some power left in the spring. Hey, did you notice that the bridge is branded Eloga, a totally different watch company? In fact, the AS1187 movement shows up in many watches, and the original train bridge may have been swapped out. We'll carefully lift out the fourth wheel, which has this long axle that attaches to the second hand. And then the third wheel. As I remove this hour wheel bridge, I want to mention the importance of keeping your screwdriver perpendicular to the screw head and applying gentle but firm downward pressure. I will release the click one more time to relieve any remaining mainspring pressure before moving on. What just happened? Oh, that's the escape wheel. I guess that's why they call it that. I'm going to remove the click which is held under pressure by a small click spring. Again, screwdriver technique is very important in doing... If you blinked, you would have missed it. I launched the screw, bounced it off my finger cot, and landed perfectly back in the movement. Next, I'm going to remove the crown wheel, which is held on with a reverse threaded screw. When you wind the crown of the watch, it transfers force through the crown wheel to the ratchet wheel and eventually winds the spring. Finally, we're removing the click, and I'm still looking for that click spring. The ratchet wheel comes out, and now the hour wheel seems to be attached to something on the back of the watch, or rather the dial side of the watch, and that thing is the cannon pinion. So I'm just going to see if I can pull it straight up with tweezers. They sell a special tool that lets you pull it up, but... 
That's an expensive tool, and well, let's see, a swing and a miss. I think I could do this with the tweezers. There we go. A little tap on the shaft of the hour wheel, and gravity helps us out, depositing the parts on my watch stand along with a bonus part. There's the hour wheel, and there is the crown wheel ring. On the back of the watch, I'm going to remove the pallet bridge, which holds the pallet in place. Here's the pallet bridge. And finally, carefully, we're going to remove the pallet, which is also called the anchor pallet, the pallet fork, or the fork. Call it what you will, it's teeny, tiny part. Okay, back to the dial side of the watch where we are going to take apart what's called the keyless works. The keyless works does a few different jobs. It allows you to wind the watch, uh, winding up that spring, and it also allows you to set the hands. The first part we're taking out is called the setting lever jumper. This minute wheel and pinion is used to set the hands. This smaller setting wheel turns the minute wheel. The silver bar on the left is called the yoke, which moves when you pull the crown in and out and it moves all the other parts in the keyless works. Here I am easing the yoke spring off, again holding it down with a stick so I don't send it flying. And here's a better look at the yoke spring. We can now remove the yoke. And this is the setting lever, but we can't take it out because it is connected on the other side by the setting lever post. So we're going to have to flip the movement over. The part at the top of the screen that tumbled out is called the sliding pinion. And gravity is helping with the disassembly. This is the winding pinion. And here is the setting lever. So we're done for now with the dial side of the movement. We're going to flip it over to the bridge side so we can get to the barrel that holds the spring. The barrel bridge is held in with three screws. Remember how earlier I said I was looking for the click spring? Well, when I turned the barrel bridge over, look what I found. There it is. The mainspring barrel, or barrel complete, is made up of four parts. There's the spring itself, there's the barrel, which is kind of like a can, there's a lid, and then there's an arbor in the center. We open it by pressing down on the arbor and popping off the lid. We want to carefully take off the cover and not unspring the spring. We'll wiggle out the arbor, which has a little hook that engages the center of the spring. And to get the spring out of the barrel, we'll tease out the end and then very, very carefully in a controlled way, release one coil at a time. That spring can go flying. But it's really not that bad. Just take your time with it. And there we go, just like that. Spring has been sprung. Here's a better look. There's the spring, there's the barrel in the middle, and the arbor on the right. Here's a look at the inside of the barrel, and yeah, there's some uh, oil in there, but it doesn't look too bad. Hey, guess what? We've taken this watch apart. Here's a better look at all the parts that have come out. This is that sliding pinion that rolled across the table before. And we're going to get these parts clean. Before putting the main plate in the cleaner, I'm going to reattach the balance so I can protect the delicate hairspring. 
a little puff of air just to make sure that it's seated correctly. And I'm going to be using these stainless steel baskets in my small ultrasonic cleaner. Take off the main plate and I'll be putting all of the larger parts directly in these larger uh, stainless steel baskets. At this stage in my watchmaking, my uh, ultrasonic regimen is very simple. I start with some warm water with a single drop of dish detergent, followed by a rinse in distilled water, and then finally a dip in isopropyl alcohol. I also have these smaller containers, and they're going to hold the uh, smaller and more delicate parts. That's the intermediate size container, and here's the smallest container. It's also important to take any other parts that you're cleaning and, and try to remove as much of the dirt and grime as you can. I'm using a wooden stick to get the nooks and crannies. And can we pop out the crystal? Why, yes we can. We may as well give the crystal a clean. There's something rewarding about the deep clean, even if no one's going to see it. We're back from the cleaning cycle and most of the liquid on here is from the alcohol dip. My uh, drying method is not fancy. Kind of a two-stage approach. I have some paper towel and then some uh, clean notebook paper. And I'm just kind of tapping off any liquid and, and letting evaporation work with me. But it, it gives you the opportunity to take a look at the parts and make sure they came clean. There were some places where the parts kind of trapped the liquid. Here I am just blotting away some of the water from the balance. We'll put this over here to dry. Even though I was pretty quick to dip in alcohol, I saw it looked like a little bit of rust on some of the wheels, but it just brushed right off. So uh, don't stress out over it. And here I am being a little bit more aggressive with the uh, spring barrel. I have some alcohol on that cotton swab and I'm using both the swab and the stick end. And then I'm going to dry anything that needs to be dried with the blower. Okay, it's time to start reassembling things, and I'm going to use this lithium grease to lubricate the spring barrel and the spring. In general, the methodology with watchmaking is to use as little lubricant as needed. Now, knowing how much is needed, that's part of you building your skills. Right now, I'm going to take some of this lithium grease and just put it on my finger cots and just pull a very thin film over the surface of the spring before we reload it into the barrel. Now there's a tool called a spring winder that lets you put the spring back into the barrel easily, but I don't have one. So I'm gonna wind this spring by hand. Yes, it's kind of a cruel joke having to hand wind a greased spring into a tiny barrel, but uh, hey, let's, uh, let's give it a try. Everything's worth a try. It appears to be in, and it is. I sped up the video, but elapsed time that took me about three and a half minutes. Now we need to insert the arbor, engage it on the end of the spring, and finally snap the cover on the barrel. Before putting on the cover, I'm gonna put a little bit more grease. I'm using that washer as something hard to press against and to give me clearance for the arbor sticking out the bottom of the barrel but something doesn't feel quite right, so I'm gonna take a moment to reassess. We're back, and guess what? I have the arbor in upside down. So let's see if we turn it the opposite direction, see if it'll let go, and it does. Now let's just try to flip it over. And yep, it looks like it wants to grab the spring, which is good. And now, now I understand why this was fighting me. And with that, I have reloaded my first mainspring barrel. Let's talk about the winding stem and crown. It really didn't get that clean in the ultrasonic cleaner. So I used this little hand vise and I got at it with the wooden stick and a lot of muck came off, but it really wasn't coming clean. So I took it into the shop, actually took off the crown and I polished it with an abrasive called Brasso. And I think it did a great job. What a difference. 
I'm sure at one time that crown was chromed, but there's no chrome left, so what you can see is the polished brass. Kind of gives it a steampunk look. To get started in watchmaking, I bought only two lubricants, which I'll link to in the description. This Molly Coat Grease, and a bottle of Mobius Multipurpose Lubricating Oil for areas like jewels, where a heavy grease would slow the wheels. But proper watch lubrication is a much more refined science, requiring up to half a dozen different lubricants for very specific areas. This investment can be pricey for someone new to watchmaking. But later I stumbled upon an affordable alternative, this Mobius watch oil sample kit, which I'll feature in an upcoming video. Now I'm going to drop in that setting lever post, which is going to get covered by that barrel bridge, so we have to put it in place in advance. There's the barrel bridge. I got a little ahead of myself here by lubricating the post here, but that's okay. As I set the screws for the barrel bridge, uh, I just want to talk to you about a little technique I use, and I do this with car mechanics. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I used my finger here. That's okay. Um, what I like to do is if there's two points of contact, I like to put both sides in loosely and then go back and tighten them evenly, and that way I feel like it, it firms up the part in more of a uh, linear fashion, and I just want to make sure that that barrel is still turning, and it is. It's looking good. As I'm recording this voiceover, I remember looking back, trying to put these train wheel gears in and just getting frustrated. And I realized I was tired. And the nice thing about this hobby is if you get tired, if you get frustrated, just put it down. Walk away. This is a hobby. And it'll happen. And it's amazing what you can accomplish if you just come back refreshed. The center wheel is in. This is the crown wheel ring. That's that little part that rolled away before. And now we're going to put in the ratchet wheel. Make sure that engages with the center wheel. And screw it in place. Now I should mention that off camera I installed the uh, click and the click spring. Here's the crown wheel which we're going to attach with that reverse threaded screw. With the center wheel properly aligned, it's time to place the center wheel bridge. Anytime you're replacing a bridge over wheels go very, very easy. It's a light touch, and when it drops into place, you'll know it. Let gravity do some of the work. We'll tighten this down. We'll replace the third wheel. Again, you don't want to force it. Just move it gently and let gravity do the work. And here's the fourth wheel with the shaft that connects to the second hand. Lightly, just a little nudge, and it feels really good when those wheels engage. Now I'm cheating a little bit here. I'm, I'm going to put some oil on the inside of these pivots. Um, the, the reason I did that before replacing the escape wheel is because there's a removable jewel on the outside, but I, I couldn't get it unstuck, so I, I kind of cheated and I put the oil on the inside of the jewel, which I know I shouldn't have done, but I did it. So we're going to replace the, uh, the train wheel bridge, again, very, very lightly. I'm applying slight pressure and then I'm turning the gears and, and waiting for them to drop into their pivots. Tighten the bridge slowly and check the gears often to make sure they're still in their jewels. If you've done it right, the train of wheels will spin freely. Woo! Let's talk about these hands. Originally, I wanted to scrape off the luminous paint and re-loom them, but these hands, being older, might contain radium, which is radioactive. I don't have a Geiger counter, but I think I'm just going to leave these things alone and put them back in the watch, and, and we'll try re-looming on a watch we know is safe. 
we're going to replace the palette very carefully, making sure that it's in its jeweled pivot. Taking a closer look, because you can't see it very well when you go to put on the uh, palette fork bridge. So it looks pretty good. So we're going to drop the bridge in, and when we're confident, we'll tighten it down. Back on the dial side of the movement, we are going to lubricate the post for the minute wheel, and then use the grease on the sliding pinion. Drop that in place. There's the winding pinion. Get in there. Here's another view of the sliding pinion. We'll put the setting wheel in place. And the minute wheel. We'll put a little bit of grease on the stem. And we will test fit it. Let's slide it into place. Now we'll replace the setting lever, which is held in place by the setting post, so we'll have to access it from the back of the movement. And I'm going to hold everything in place with my finger while I flip it over so the parts don't fall out. The next part in the keyless works to be replaced is the yoke. The tip of the yoke rides in that sliding pinion. And now we have to replace the yoke spring. Stay. Okay, let's put the setting lever jumper in place. We're going to get it almost down and then we want to set that spring and now we can tighten it the rest of the way. It's setting the uh, hands pushed in. It seems to be winding. With a few winds in the spring, it was time to check the pallet fork to see if it's snapping back and forth decisively. You know, it looks a little bit anemic. Well, let's put in the balance and let's see if we can... Uh, bring some life into this watch some life where there was no life before with a few puffs from the blower it started running but it wasn't running very strongly i was discouraged but i knew i still needed to clean and oil the jewels watch what a difference a drop of oil made it started up again. There was hope. I oiled all the jewels that were accessible. Lubricating the keyless works. And then I opened up my first package of Rodico, which is a putty that's used to clean up excess oil and grease. And let's take a look at things underneath the microscope. This watch is labeled as Inca Block, which is a shock setting that protects the jewel that holds the balance wheel in place. And it's held in this special clasp. That's the shock absorbing clasp. And we're going to lift the capsule, which is a two piece jewel, out of its setting with a piece of Rodico and then very carefully. And we saw where it landed. So there's two parts to this jewel. And we need to clean them, make a little sandwich of oil, and then put it back in the shock mount. So I'm going to use some naphtha, uh, a.k.a. lighter fluid, in a contact lens container here. And uh, we're going to swish the jewels around a little bit and try to dissolve some of the uh, old gummed-up oil that's on them. 
Well, they're both still there. That's a good thing. I'm going to very carefully take them out and put them on the paper, and then I'm rubbing them against the paper with that wooden stick. I need to put a single drop of oil in the middle of the jewel, put it within its cap, and then drop the assembly back into the watch and close that Inca block setting. Let's pause to appreciate some of the parts we just put back together under the microscope. And if you're wondering, yes, all that extra grease got cleaned up before moving on to the next step. I plan to use the original crystal, but it is covered with scratches. I've had really good success using PolyWatch, which is a mildly abrasive polish. If you'd like to see my detailed recommendations on using PolyWatch, then please check out my video, Open a Stuck Watchback, which has a section dedicated to polishing acrylic crystals. And how do we do? With the exception of one stubborn gouge, I think we did great. It's time to put the dial back onto the watch, but I couldn't get one of the dial posts into the hole. The problem was that this dial screw was cracked when you turned the head, the bottom part wouldn't go anywhere. It was stuck in the movement. I ended up wedging a toothpick behind it to apply pressure, and then I noodled with the screw until I could back it out enough to get the dial post in the hole. We got it. I was able to tighten the dial with the one remaining healthy post, which was good enough for this project. So now it's time to attach the hands before putting the watch in the case. Putting hands on a three-hand watch is pretty straightforward. Just pick an hour and line them all up. If you'd like to learn the extra steps of servicing a watch with a date complication, please check out my video, Learning Watch Repair on a 1970s Dive Watch. Once each hand is in position, I set it in place using this hand presser tool. To case up the movement, first I need to install the crystal. It easily popped out, so first I tried to push it in by hand. But that didn't work, so I got out my watch press, which I've shown in previous videos. By using a big die up top and a small die beneath, I am able to gently bend the crystal into more of a dome shape, which makes the bottom just slightly smaller, allowing me to ease it into the case. Oh! I broke it. You know, sometimes things don't go as planned. But the show must go on, so I'm going to finish casing up the watch. It's still not running great, but I don't really care because of everything I've learned throughout this project. I'm going to close it up. And here is where this watch repair will come to an end. This project is a humble reminder that the journey can be more fulfilling than the final destination. If you enjoyed coming along for the ride, please give the video a thumbs up, and if you'd like to know about my upcoming videos, please subscribe to the channel. I'm Mike, the channel is Watch With Mike. Thank you for joining me on this watchmaking journey. Be good, be well, and be safe, and I look forward to our next time together.